Good evening and welcome to everybody that's joined us tonight. Uh, uh, our new challenge seminar. We are looking at uh, a series of these uh, over the last 18 months. Uh, and this one is on the United Nations Sustainable Goal to End Hunger. Sounds a dramatic uh, outcome, uh, but of course it's a long journey to end hunger. Um, and I think it's not uh, something we can go without saying that uh, last night when I sat up and watched the television uh, around what's happening in Ukraine, on uh, February the 21st, or moving into 22nd, uh, there will be an impact on hunger around the world, I'm sure, as a result of that. Uh, not least the fact that they are uh, a supplier of grain, I know, to other parts of the world, but also in terms of the impact on oil prices and transport costs. So somewhere or other down the line, uh, we'll be impacted by the, the events of last night uh, regarding hunger. Next slide, Bert. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, we're going to work through this as a fairly sequence. Uh, we, we talk about informing and educating and inspiring to change. And I think uh, if he will be the person we look to for some inspiration a bit down this presentation. Uh, so if we go to the, you know, we're looking at hunger and current headlines, where we think we are now. Um, we're looking at cause and perspectives on hunger. We're going to look at where we, where we want to be in 2030 and then hunger and sustainable development and then some challenges and opportunities that's our agenda for tonight if i can move on but so if you think about hunger is not a new thing uh, i found this map from the new york, new york times in 19 from 1919 and it shows areas of the world that were suffering hunger and of course uh, the darker areas there you're looking at the famine uh, in russia at the time you know uh, you look at other parts of the europe and there's a famine that's going on there. Um, if you think, think about back to uh, ancient Egypt, there's a recorded famine in 2000 BC. Uh, you think about uh, 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 Russia in 1920-21, when I think 5 million people die from hunger. There's a Bengal famine in, 19, in 1943, 3 million people. There's the Irish famine that we talk about and we've heard about in, from England point of view anyway. Uh, in 1879, it talks about the deaths from famine in Ireland. And in particular, uh, a family link here when uh, in Sudan in 1984, when the Ethiopian Eastern African famine was occurring, um, my parents were working in Sudan and uh, very rarely did my mother phone. You couldn't phone at those times, but she happened to be in Nairobi. Um, and I spoke to her in tears. This is before Band Aid. And I said, How's things, Mum? She said, Well, people died outside our house yesterday from famine and there's a, a compelling feature of of you know why why on earth in the worlds that we live in we have these things going on even today in 2022 next one pete uh, bert please i'm not going to go through and explain all these things they're things that you can read for yourselves but these are current headlines and if you look at things just to tease things out you and world un world food program uh, and this is very recently, 7th of November 2021, 43 countries, 45 million, up by 3 million that year. Uh, Madagascar is on the brink of a famine. We don't hear these stories in the normal press, but they are there. Uh, they're they are, these are real people in real settings. Uh, and you're looking at the proportion of those that affect women and girls. And of course, there's a, 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 a pattern there that says, they're at most at risk from severe malnutrition. And you talk about 45 million children globally. Next slide, please, Bert. Again, worst uh, where we are now, the worst mm -hmm. drought 30 years yeah. followed by freezing winter, winter and it's 90% of Afghans do not have enough to eat. Uh, and we see on the television sometimes the harrowing stories of children being sold or offered up to other people in order that their other parts of the family can survive. Um, it's not on the uh, link tonight, but one of our trustees uh, is actually fostering three Afghan refugees. And they are in the midst of hearing stories from their own families in Afghan 
about the terrible conditions that their extended families are now dealing with. Uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, the Irish, <laughs> Irish Times, a hunger pandemic to hit low income countries in 2022. Uh, UN food banks, uh, we heard last time from one of our Lincolnshire uh, uh, people who organizes food banks. And it talks about the uh, rise in food banks in the UK in the last period of time. Next slide, please. If you can see the graph there, it talks about the number of severely insecure people by region. And you'll see there the majority there, Africa, Asia, and then Central America and South America up in red, and then other ones at the top there. But Africa and Asia are your main areas of food insecurity. Next slide, please, Bert. Just on where we are, current headlines, 8.8% of the world's population are undernourished. So it's not just about famine. It's not just about that, it's about undernourished. And if undernourished uh, means it's a child that's undernourished, then there's an impact down the line for that child and their development, and also the families and the uh, development of that community that they are in. 9% of the world population are severely food insecure, 697 million people. Uh, one in four people globally are moderately or severely food insecure. These are startling headlines in what I would regard at 2022 relatively as a world full of plenty. Next slide, please. Again, going back from the international picture to local, and this is our own area. Uh, you're talking about Lincolnshire Food Bank's mm -hmm. constant battle to feed the hungry. One in three people, it helps our children. That's the case to Food Bank near me, small rural village in November 21. Next one, please. When we're talking about it in terms of the UK, and this is fingers from the, the Trussell Trust, uh, the numbers of food banks that are operating uh, and distributing food. So you've got 5,100 emergency food parcels a day to people in that crisis in 21, April 21 to 30th September, an increase of 11%. And there's some figures there around the nations and you can see that it is not settled in one particular area, it's widespread across the UK. So bringing that story home in terms of hunger, uh, there's a, an agenda both locally, nationally, and internationally. Next one, please, Bert. So a bit of perspective on here, what causes hunger? We can start where we like on this. I mean, the top right of my war and conflict. Uh, we don't have to look very far to see that that happens and the food supplies in war and conflict zones are often appropriated by those that are leading the wars and the conflicts. So again, there's a massive agenda around those who have not in those settings and get less. Natural change, climate disasters, climate disasters, social inequality, unfair global trade. If you look at the uh, who gets what in the trades of many of the goods, there's a small proportion goes to growers and providers, uh, and there are people through the uh, trading systems that appropriate uh, bigger incomes from others. Um, poor governance and infrastructure, unemployment, food waste, and we'll hear about food waste substantially from uh, Ifiana. Uh, later on, if you uh, from uh, IntelliDigest. When you look at the, uh, the sustainable development goals, it's interesting how you go around that circle and see other sustainable goals identified. So when we're talking about what causes issues around one goal, we can almost always link it to other goals that are in the pattern of the 17 that's there. Next one, please, Bert. Hunger in a modern world. Um, again, you, when, you, when you look at these things, or just do a bit of digging, uh, you look at this from the state of Montana. You know, uh, the United States, here's Montana in 2021, uh, and it's talking about food and poverty insecurity. And it's talking about hard choices and poor nutrition. It's talking about uh, struggle in school. The hard choices, heat or eat. I mean, we're talking about that in the UK now. Um, struggle in school, 
um, I know that uh, my background in education says if you're trying to teach youngsters uh, in the morning and they've not had something to eat, uh, there really isn't a lot you can deal with. They're, they're more immediate concerns that the youngsters have. There are many, many schools now working with food uh, uh, as a way of introducing uh, the day to get uh, you know, nutrition and to, to start, to start the things off. Uh, low wage jobs, obviously, lower salaries, uh, issues around what type of food you eat, as well as whether you can afford it. He talks about this is in Montana, physical and mental health problems, expensive medical bills. Again, that's a, a state, uh, United States issue where much of the medicine uh, agenda there is privatized. It's not part of a state facility. Uh, decreased ability to work. They're talking about this cycle of food uh, poverty and food insecurity. And as it says in there, some people don't get past stage one, hard choices. And I'm sure that that's the dialogue that sometimes we see in the UK, but again, we can exponentially roll that out across the world. Next one, please, Bert. Again, food supply. Strange words are here. The world's farmers produce enough food to feed 1.5 times the global population. When people say there isn't enough food, evidence suggests from uh, reliable sources that we currently have enough to supply far more than we have. And largely, uh, the ability to, to, to supply them all is tied up with either the, uh, the food chains that they are worked through or to do the waste that appears through the food chains. So globally, when you look at from, uh, from a seed to a product, or right the way through to a, a consumption, 30 to 4 percent of all, 30 to 40 percent of all food is wasted. And of course, uh, in less developed countries, some of it's is to do with the infrastructure uh, and knowledge to keep fresh food, but uh, uh, it can also be to do with the, uh, the, the 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 small scale agenda there about how you can store food and preserve food. Uh, in more developed countries, again, the lower relative cost of food uh, reduces the incentives to to to, uh, to waste. Um, so what happens? It gets thrown out uh, and wasted. And I know that uh, there are substantial programs that uh, uh, that run now with supermarkets on the types of things they can either offer to other places or as part of their food chain, where they're introducing different products that come forward. Uh, rather than seeing the perfect apple or the perfect uh, uh, potato, they're looking at other ways of dealing with that. Next one, please, Bert. Where do you want to be? End hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Um, the last bit, I know that uh, uh, on our uh, screen tonight, we've got Clifford uh, Spencer and he's at substantial experience in sustainable agriculture. And it's interesting about, it's not just about producing more, it's about producing more in the appropriate ways. And it's, uh, uh, I've got a good friend here who uh, I think I've explained before during lockdown, he's, uh, he's now 80, I took him to, uh, we went walking together across the fields in Lincolnshire and he was an agronomist. And he said, uh, I said to him one day, I said, well, how long have you known that what you were saying to farmers in the 50s, 60s, 70s was not doing the soil and the environment so well? Oh, we knew it then, he said. But the agenda then was to maximize yield, maximize yield. So again, uh, ending hunger is about doing that sustainably in this modern world with our knowledge base. So it's time to rethink how we grow how we share and consume. Next one, please, Bert. Right now, our soils, freshwater, oceans, forests, and that are being rapidly degraded in climate change. So if it's about addressing these things here, it isn't just about uh, making more, it's about doing appropriately. And it's also about the roles that people have in the, the work uh, of producing food. So, a profound change in the global food and agricultural system is needed. Uh, and it's about doing that in a way that empowers people to take charge of that rather than depowers them. 
and I think that's something we need to talk about uh, down the line about how in the food system and if you follow uh, the route of a product from seed to supermarket to table and that's an exercise I've done with people in the past uh, following a banana and talking about the roles and the jobs and the uh, pieces of a banana actually that people have if in, in money terms as it goes through uh, it gives an insight into uh, the notion of re returns to do with poverty, but also in terms of the waste. So you think about the types of bananas there are in the world and what few varieties actually get to table. Next one, Bert. I'm going to hand over now uh, to uh, Ife Inwa. I think we can call her Ife or Ife Inwa, uh, who I met, I think, on a Zoom call. I'm not sure it was the Royal Society of Arts or the UNA, but uh, we've corresponded in the past. And as it shows there, um, we were inspired by what she was saying then. And I'm sure we'll be inspired by what uh, she can tell us tonight uh, by use of her uh, expertise and imagination into the work she's doing. Can I hand over now to you, Ify? So thank you very much, Cleve. Well, thanks everyone for joining the discussion this evening. I think it's been a very um, explicit conversation that um, or insight that Cleve has provided for us tonight around the SDG2, around hunger, um, more what we love to call it until it digest is looking at it in, in the sense of food system sustainability how could we um ensure that we can achieve um, good food for all ensuring that the way we produce food the way we get it to people and the way people engage with food is as sustainable as possible now um until it digest was founded in 2016 um our focus is as I mentioned, enabling food system sustainability through technology innovation and capacity building. Next slide, please. So central to what we do is evolving a secular food system is where we can ensure that food is produced in the most sustainable way using bio-nutrients. And also that when we produce food, we can get that food to people as easily as possible, but more importantly, helping people rethink the approach to food. So currently in the world of today, we believe that we can get food at any time we want it. And we don't really plan ahead of, you know, what we're going to eat, how we're going to source our food. But if we're going to go on holiday, we need to plan, we need to save, we need to think about what the holiday is going to look like and how we're going to, um, go on the journey and then come back safely. Now, when it comes to the food system, we need to take the same approach because if we fail to plan, then we plan to fail. So our approach at Intel Digest is to help people to plan to save in the food system. So when you're saving, you're not just saving your money, you're saving your health and you're saving the environment. So SDG2, hunger, has a lot in connection with environment, with our health, as well as also the entire economy. So how do we ensure that food gets to people in the most sustainable way and that people on the average will have access to the needed nutrient requirement for the daily existence? Now think about it. What we want to do is to ensure that we start having a mind shift around food. That food is not just because of its aesthetics, not because of its taste, it's not because of its affordability and availability. It's, it's more on human existence that we eat food because when we put food in our mouth, we our body extract nutrients that keeps that and tend to keep us healthy. Now how do we source the right nutrients for our body and ensure that our body takes in adequate nutrient that keeps us going while also helping the farmers who grow the food to grow in the most sustainable way. 
And at the end of the day, after processing the food, after cooking the food, whatever waste we have, how can we return it back into the food system so that we can continue to improve our environment? So this is what circular food system is all about. It's all about our entire engagement, how the whole supply chain from farm to freight work together in unison to be able to deliver a circular food system. Now, one of the key things we've done at IntelliDigest is to launch what we call the Plan to Save campaign. What the Plan to Save campaign does is that it helps you in that planning process of thinking about what am I going to eat in the next six months? What if I can let the farmers around me know what I'm going to eat in the next six months? Would that help the farmer to have the confidence to think around what they are growing and how they're growing it? And what if everyone in my neighborhood can do the same thing? Could it mean that we can then overall help our farmers or even help, especially young people, to engage in food production so that we have more distributed food production? And then we can start thinking about mixed cropping. We can start thinking about regenerative agriculture. With the current system we have, there is no way we can run a regenerative agricultural system. And it's only when we are society's individuals are able to take that step to say, we want to help our farmers plan ahead. Because why are we getting travels and holidays cheaper now? Because we go to um, this travel agent and we book ahead of time. So they are able to plan better. They're able to get us cheap flights, cheap accommodation. Why do we do it in such leisure and we don't do it to the food we eat? That food you eat is what that helps you keep your body and soul together, keep you healthy, make you function better. Why don't you take some time to plan around your food? The bottom line is that when we do that planning, it helps our body because then we start looking at food, not just because of how it looks, but because of nutrient content. Now, if you get a piece of apple, because the farmer has told you, based on analysis, that this piece of apple contains this nutrient, irrespective of the shape of the apple, you have a different mindset by getting that apple because then you're thinking about the nutrient content, the farmer has told you that contains. And then you're consuming that apple, not because of its look, not because of its shape, but because of the nutrient content. And then you're thinking around other things you need to eat to balance that. And then once you balance that, it simply means that you then have a way to engage with the farmer to produce the food sustainably. And any waste you have can actually be returned to the farmer because the farmer is close by, works with you, and you work with the farmer for a better society. So I think that is really what we're pushing with, with the plan to say that we can start having the same attitude we have or the way we plan our holidays and other activities towards the food we eat. Because if we do that, all the stress on NHS is going to come down because we are going to be eating healthier food. We're going to be eating more balanced diet. Now, what people don't understand, which is one of the um, pools I like to run when I, when I do events, is that one in five deaths is linked to malnutrition. And how does it happen? Because we don't eat the right nutrient. We don't take the right nutrient our body needs to fight infections, even infections that our body could fight and we get better. But because we're eating the wrong food, that means we can always be kind of pulled down by several forms of infection. So I think it's, it's really important. It's, it's not just seeing this as an environmental issue. It is, it's kind of a public health issue when it comes to you know, things around SDG2, you know, hunger, food waste, it's a public health issue, it's an environmental issue, it's an economic issue. And as societies, as individuals, we can really change how we engage with the food system and how we can help ourselves to help our farmers to actually produce the right food we, we need and also help us to have access to the right food in the most efficient way. So that is all about you know, food circularity, how we can really engage with the food system, ensure food circularity, you know, you know, take on uh, our own bit of responsibility as, as part of the society and also part of the food system to drive food. So, 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 okay. So what that? Yeah, thanks. So 
So that's lots of simple means is that once we do that, we'll find out that also um, within the wider ecosystem, within the global market, there will be an improved understanding about food system sustainability and also more food will be available to more people just because we're kind of planning better as a society and balancing the gaps in, in availability of food. Um, next slide, please. So um, I think you know the key thing is that Intel Digest is really working um, with different stakeholders across the food system to be able to deliver this. And um, we're very much excited about the Plan to Save campaign, which is helping people rethink the approach to food. We have a number of technologies which we are developing to enable this platform. Next slide, please. So we have the tracker platform, um, which is the World Food Tracker, where we will be able to help people do the planning, help people rethink the approach to food, also um, help to distribute that food using um, the ICVA, which extends the shelf life of agri-food produce in the most efficient way, and also the iDigest, which enables the you know, recovery of bionutrient, it enhances bionutrient recovery so that we can use it more in, in, in food production. Next slide, please. And also, uh, as part of what we do in terms of capacity building, we run the plant safe campaign, which I've touched a lot on, some master classes um, for stakeholders in the food system, which helps to drill down into the system, you know, food system sustainability issues, um, an index that will help them to track, measure, track, and uh, monitor food system sustainability. I'm very excited. We just ended um, the recent call on agri-food techpreneur, we, we are we are on a global scale, inviting young people to be part of the food system. We received over 100 applications, which closed yesterday, and we're looking to work with these young graduates all over the world to help them engage with the food system. What we want to see is enhanced local food production um, and also a wider understanding through these young people on how we can improve on, 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 on the food system, because that's the only way we can stop hunger. That's the only way we can help people um, improve access to um, nutritious food and also uh, prevent the impact of food waste on the environment. Next slide, please. There's a lot of um, sustainable food production um, that we need to build into the agri-food system, whether it has to do with uh, mixed cropping, uh, crop rotation, uh, agroforestry, regenerative agriculture. There's a lot we can do as a society, but the way our food system is structured at the moment is so difficult for these farmers to take the risk to go into sustainable farming. They have been fo they're focused for a long time, you know, like Cliff did mention, on yield. How do I increase the yield in this plot of land so that I maximize profit? But I think it's time we move from just increasing yield to increasing health and also increasing sustainability overall. So how do we do that in the most efficient and sustainable way? This is we are thinking holistically about the circularity of the food system is very important. That comes back to all I've been saying about how do we then improve on what on our understanding about you know, what we eat, how do we plan for it? How is our plan in helping the farmers to be able to engage meaningfully in sustainable agri-food production? And then how do we take back what we have as processed uh, food material back into the food system to help improve in you know, enhancing soil nutrient, enhancing soil composition and, and improving the quality of food we produce. But more importantly is that issue about nutrient, nutrient, nutrient. How do we understand that the food we're eating is meant to improve our nutritional um, consumption and very, very vital is how do we ensure that everyone could have access to the minimum nutrient requirement that they need to survive as human beings. That is vital, that is important. And unless we work together as individuals, as societies, it will be difficult to make that and we'll then come back again to this issue of hunger. But I think the COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to rethink how we do things, to rethink the way uh, we build back our society because we've seen that the global supply chain is not working efficiently for us in the midst of pandemics. How can we make our food system more resilient? How can we support local food production so that even in the midst of pandemics, we don't have issues around food supply 
and that can only happen if the society can work together, if we can plan on what we eat. The way we plan our holidays, we need to plan our food. We need to help our farmers to rethink what they, how they produce food and how we can support them to produce it sustainably. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ifyana. Uh, uh, the, it's interesting how that, leave that picture on the moment, Bert. Um, two stories to add to that picture. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a, the Queen had a Commonwealth Leaders Award programme, and there were young people chosen from the Commonwealth, and I was privileged to be involved in, as a mentor with that. And a lady called Bagia from Sri Lanka uh, asked for some support, and she was working in Sri Lanka, and what she had learned in her youth uh, was to do things on her own piece of land, in her own garden, with her family and extended family. But she said, increasingly, as young people grow up, they migrate to cities. They lose their ability uh, to want to do things with growing their own food. And uh, what happens then is they become addicted to the modern consumption activity, whether the, you know, the modern products that we all know about are served through supermarkets and uh, self-service uh, um, uh, franchises, without saying too many words about the type of product I'm talking about. But of course, her project was how we get young people to learn to grow their own food. And the picture there is an interesting picture because she was trying to work out how on earth she got small children uh, to be educated to grow food in their own back gardens. In Sri Lanka, she said, wonderful climate, wonderful things you can grow there, but it's about how they re you resurrect in young people the skills that have been there for many, many years, but are uh, removed through the notion of development. So getting short uh, journeys to uh, from, from seed uh, to fork uh, uh, in the most local area you can. And that was an, uh, an interesting we had. Um, sorry a bit of I, advice. Sorry, sorry to leave, but I, don't just remind me about my son. He came in um, the other day and was saying to me that our neighbor's cat always like to come to our garden because he comes into the, the cat comes into big slugs and, and some other um, insects. Uh, but he, he doesn't know why our neighbors still go like concrete and, and some yeah. people and we don't have so sorry that our garden is not looking nice because why the cat likes coming to our garden. I was like, no, our garden is sustainable. That's why the cat loves to come to our garden. Even if he's on a boss cat, he just loves to be there. So I think it's really important. Um the ecosystem, you know, just balancing the ecosystem with you know, people love concrete and stuff, but we can just do that more sustainably. There's other there are other ways to design concrete around um, gardens and stuff. So yeah, what you're saying is just valid. I just remember that and I felt like that's a practical uh, way to kind of strengthen what you're saying. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and so so again, it's about how you get those things going. And uh, her her problem at the time was how you get that disseminated. She wanted to set up a school. Uh, to do it and bring people to a school uh, but we actually uh, ended up with uh, in England there is the uh, uh, the radio 4 program uh, on food on far on the uh, I forgot the name gardeners question time and uh, what I ended up we agreed and she went away and, and found out a way of doing a type of gardeners question time going around small local communities and getting them talking about things and recording it and putting it out on the radio station so small groups were actually feeding each other's ideas uh, to others through that process. And that was an interesting kind of uh, aside on the on the pitch you got there. Uh, if you go on, please, Bert, next slide. And it's the challenges, there's from local to international. We know that our food distribution system is inefficient and it's uh, it won't drive two billion people more into hunger by 2050. Climate change will. And so the notion of sustainability and nutrition and climate come linked together again. So we are linked to other uh, SDGs. Business as usual, it's interesting, in many ways is not an option, both at macro and micro level. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna put it out here that uh, if you do your own mental gymnastics here, how many of those can you think are not linked to zero hunger?
I wonder if there'd be silence on the on the back of this. And uh, I guess you're all trying to work out whether you can get rid of any one of them. And I think my observation is when I went through this and thought about it, they're all in some way linked to the issues around uh, hunger in, in, in the real world. Next slide, Bert, please, Bert. Um, uh, we, we've heard before about a circular economy in terms of how you look at a, a life cycle and a, a circular way of working everything. This is the other one that says, if you're gonna look at new ways of thinking, uh, this is the, uh, the notion of the, the, the macroeconomic donut economy model, again, about finding a space for humanity to exist and thrive against the constraints on the outside, uh, seeking to reduce those issues that are inside, which are the social foundations of society. So if you don't address those in the middle, uh, within the constraints of the external uh, climate change, freshwater issues, uh, land, uh, then you're making it an unsustainable future. So that's the challenges uh, that we have to do both locally, nationally, and internationally. Next one, please, Bert. Um, this is again, Montana. And I was interested in this because this is a modern economy and they talk about the eight step local plan. Uh, so it's talking about, let's address this through breakfast for school children, uh, meals during the school day. It talks about the access to uh, public food programs. And it goes right the way through this eight step local program in order to deal with things in a modern advanced industrialized economy. And I thought, well, good grief, why are they having to do this? It challenged me to think, well, okay, if it's about something there, they're looking at these things here, yeah, let's take that. Let's take their thinking and say, let's apply it elsewhere. Let's make sure that these things are gonna happen elsewhere so this can work. Some years ago, I worked in, I did a project work in Brazil where there were children living on a, a dump, a waste dump outside Recife. And they earned their living by collecting tin cans and those things that you could recycle. They were the, you know, the agents of recycling on a dump. And they sold those things to get uh, food for the family. Um, in order to address that uh, and change what they're doing to get an education, uh, the first thing uh, the program I was uh, involved with said, if you come to school, we will give you a meal. So it meant that going onto the site to do what they had to do was not as necessary because they're fed at school. And because they got a meal at school, then they could get an education and they could afford that not to be on the site picking stuff, they could get an education. Again, food drove that development agenda, the ability to provide uh, some nutrition for youngsters so they could go to school and to learn uh, and then thereafter find ways of earning. Next slide, Bert. Uh, so we go down to a call to action. And when you think about what we're trying to do here, uh, and that's what our challenge seminar is about. I talked about at the start, um, the notion of uh, you as a consumer, myself as a producer, consumer, and myself as a producer, consumer, and citizen. And in those roles I have, what are things that we can do? And so the challenge is, uh, and our discussion is around uh, what is it we can do individually and together to make a difference. I'm going to open that up now, but is that okay? Let me put the screen back on. So the challenge is for us all, um, thoughts, ideas, possibilities. Put your hand up or just uh, wave or just uh, indicate, we'll, we'll take a discussion. We've got a 20 or so minutes if we wish to use it. Uh, Any thoughts? A uh, 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 comment, Clive? Carry on, yes. This is, this is uh, Cliff speaking. Uh, I've been involved in agriculture all my life. And the system that we have in the West is utterly unsustainable. It's fossil fuel driven. And I, I put it akin to farmers be almost being like drug addicts. They can't get off the system because they're addicted to it. And the system is very well embedded. 
is very well structured and very difficult to get out of. There's only four or five major supermarkets buying food in the UK and only a handful of suppliers into agriculture. So my feeling is that the future is actually helping developing countries get good systems in place, ones that aren't like ours. Um, and my big fear is that actually developing countries pick on our systems and mimic them, which will just compound the problem. So I, I take my hats off to IFI and her, uh, her efforts because it's only by going to developing countries and helping them and working and collaborating together, I think we'll get over this problem. Uh, the, the idea of us solving it here, I think is, is um, just a non-starter. Thank you, Clifford. Whilst you're there, are there new crops or ideas for new crops that, that you're aware of that uh, need to be considered? Is it just about doing the same things all the time or is it uh, in terms of no, our sustainability? We, we need to transform our agriculture. Uh, we are no longer farmers. Uh, we're we're um, uh, industrial producers. We don't, we don't treat the land as a living thing. We, we don't uh, work with nature. We actually directly combat it and we, we try to destroy or remove anything that gets in our way. Um, quite the opposite of what uh, a sensible and balanced and sustainable farming system involves. But I think, it, and, and people are making significant efforts, the regenerative uh, um, and the no-till agricultural movement. But again, I, I still feel that where agriculture hasn't been developed as the West has developed it. And so it, it's still got a, 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 an ability to take a different route that's got to be a very profitable way for the world to operate. And, and I hope many people in the West recognize that and actually take a more global view. There's an awful lot of technology here and some of the technology that IFA has been developing um, will pay the greatest dividends in developing countries and, and make sure the systems in place that are sustainable and then it makes it easier for, um, for the rest of the world to correspond. And to give an example, Africa will have over a billion extra people there in the next 30 years. And putting our efforts there to help deal with that problem will actually help solve some of our own. Okay, thank you. Anybody else that uh, wants to join this discussion, just uh, join in please. Can I can I ask can I ask a question? You perhaps like to to uh, answer this one. When you, when you're going around the supermarket shelves and you're making your purchases or your online purchase, um, is there anything that you have chosen to do differently in the last uh, period of time uh, around sustainability or uh, uh, or the ways in which you see food being produced? Um, I would say, I would say um, that um, the, the fact that the supermarkets now sell more dish dish shaped uh, vegetables and fruits, so at least in the last year, perhaps more so than earlier, I tended to go for them more than uh, I would have done before. Well, they, they weren't there before. I think was it Waitrose used to do them, but more than supermarkets seem to do it now. Um, one, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I mean, one thing I've, uh, over the, uh, obviously most of you have, probably have noticed that um, certainly in the last, ten, last decade or even 15 years, there appears to be more and more uh, produce uh, which are all the year round. Whereas a lot of the um, uh, lot of the uh, fruit fruit and vegetables used to be seasonal, 
I mean, strawberries, for example, they're all the year round. 30, 40, 50 years ago, you were lucky if you could see them in the summer. Yeah. And, 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 and it's, um, it seemed to be an, um, I mean, uh, things like um, in, um, uh, watermelons, melons, uh, mangoes, um, you know, uh, e even uh, I'm from India, and even in my young days, uh, there were even in the mangoes and all these uh, exotic fruits uh, were grown and they were seasonal. But here, in the, looking at the supermarket, you go to Tesco's, uh, any of the Sainsbury's, any of the they're there all the year round. So it's, um, uh, I suppose we give very little, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm much to blame as anybody that uh, we, we just take this, we go go shopping every day and look at the, uh, the, the, the produce and uh, you, you don't even think about you want to go and stop? No, it's potato. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jan. Um, I think you're on. You're, are you? Uh, oh, <laughs> I think Elizabeth in Birmingham was just uh, on muted. Is it Hillary? Is going to say something? Uh, yes, I was just going to say this comes back to uh, something you said at the beginning about um, uh, using our spending patterns to make a difference. Because you know, uh, uh, again, we. We, I really feel quite strongly that we shouldn't be buying stuff out of season that's been brought from the other side of the world. Um, it, it's just it's just not sustainable. We, we should try and follow the patterns of, of vegetables and fruits. I mean, obviously, you know, if you want to buy a banana, then the only way of getting it is to bring it from the other side of the world. But things like apples don't need to be brought from New Zealand or Australia. In, we, why can't we just wait until they're in season here? Mm. Um, so I, th I think we do have a responsibility for, for trying to follow the seasons. And the other thing is packaging, of course, in supermarkets, which is getting better uh, quite dramatically, I think, but it still has quite a long way to go. A great example, Clive, you asked for changes in behaviour. And, uh, I don't know if you've spotted it yet, but for those of us in and around the market raising area, there's a new shop, the Green Life Pantry, that has opened in market raising and it is it's one of these absolutely fantastic places where you can go in and buy small amounts of those ingredients that you might not use in big quantities in everyday cooking uh, you bring your own containers in that you can can fill to whatever weight uh, and it's an absolutely brilliant step forward you know it's still quite niche unfortunately but initiatives like that are absolutely fantastic. And, and certainly for Carolyn and myself, we're trying to get into using initiatives like that more and more. Uh, and, and just along with, with basic better food planning for home, it's amazing how much stuff we used to waste. Uh, so, you know, small steps, but sort of things we're trying to do now. Thank you. Um just a, another question then just uh, just to push things forward and, and feel free just to join in that w when we when we've set these things up we decided that these are like fireside conversations as opposed to public debates because i think this is where other people can understand that it's ordinary people having a, a sensible discussion so in terms of um, uh, when we talk about hunger and food banks uh, what's your take on that for uh, for the UK or for the local area that you live in? You know, what is it that's driving this issue around food banks? I'm, sure, I'm sorry that Sue Fortune isn't with us now. Uh, they were talking about um, the number of the growth of food banks in recent times in the UK and how uh, they couldn't understand why there was not more done to address that. What is it that's causing that to, to happen? Um, uh, if that's a, a non-contentious a non thing, I mean, is it, does anybody here support food banks? Okay. I think I may comment a little bit there. Um, with regards to uh, food banks and why it's growing, you know, it all boils down to, you know, 
the mm-hmm. what what people are feeling and, and and what people are going through in society, especially what we've seen within the um, global pandemic, and and more importantly, the fact that um, we've had a, a, a very um, difficult time with uh, the global supply chain being really disrupted during the pandemic. So there isn't that flow of food items, and and I think about two weeks ago the the chairman of Tesco was mentioning that there is likely to be about you know some increment in, in the cost of food for the general public. So uh, it all boils down to how we grow in food today and how we having access to food and also what is the focus um, of the, the decision makers, the policy makers around the food system. Is, is there more effort and attention towards um, the, the global market and what could be exported and economic value of food against making food available for the local people? And I think this is something that every government is really um, facing because everyone wants to increase their the, the um, export and also increase the economic value. And that then hits back on the local community because when the decision makers and the policy makers are thinking around, well, these are our key exports, this is where we all make more money, this is where we all will invest the resources on because it's going to make us more money. And you know, the, our global exports going to look a lot bigger and, and, and more interesting. And then you're not looking at how do you then support local food production to make sure that food is well distributed and available to the local economy, then there's a problem. So I think it's all about you know decision makers coming to understand the importance of helping local people have access to food and then put in resources to make that work uh, in the most efficient way, but also um, individuals, sorry, just being able to help to make that work too. I think it's kind of a two way thing that everyone needs to work together and understand that we need to help um, the food system. And like I did mention in my presentation, understanding the demand for nutrient consumption and making sure that everyone will have access to that minimum nutrient requirement required for human existing. I think that's where we need to go back to and then we can build up from there. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting how we talk about uh, climate and we talk about the two words, mitigation and adaptation in terms of the managing climate change. And I think it's the same we're talking about here that the food banks are a mitigation there's something we're doing to address a particular moment in time, but there's uh, things that Clifford said about uh, adaptation then to, to new ways of doing things. Uh, if, if Yanwa, um, when I first met you or first <laughs> met you in uh, on, on virtually, <laughs> um, you talked about uh, the, the notion of food waste and the, the work you're doing with food waste. Could you tell us something about that with the digesters? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, I just didn't want to focus a lot on that because we're looking at what people can take away from this conversation. That's why I kind of focused on the plant to save campaign. Um, but what we do at Intel Digest, which all, you know, brought about the plant to save campaign is built on my PhD research. So I did my PhD looking at the use of artificial intelligence and omics analysis to optimize anaerobic processes. Now, what, what are anaerobic digesters? Anaerobic digesters are fundamentally designed as waste water treatment systems or waste treatment systems. But what we've turned anaerobic digesters today is to an energy generation system. So that is also a fundamental floor in our approach to using technology. Rather than using technology to treat waste and recover nutrients, we start using technology to generate energy, which simply means that we, we then design the systems with a mindset of generating energy and maximizing energy generation rather than maximizing um, waste, waste treatment and recovery. And that became a problem because then you have to source nutrient, well, you have to source um, substrates, materials to put into this unit. And what I was trying to do is design the units and make it efficient. And I realized that what we're doing is not right because um, that's not what the system is designed for. We need to focus more on how can we recover bio-nutrients from this, especially when it comes to food waste, then anaerobic digester is not the right way to go because Anaerobic digester can be used in manure treatment. It can be used in wastewater treatment, 
but not food waste treatment because there's so much nutrient embedded in food waste that we want to be able to recover those nutrients and put it back into the food system so that we can improve food production. And that is the right you know, channel that we should take the food waste to. Uh, and more importantly, we're not kind of promoting, you know, edible food waste production. We're talking about inedible food waste production. So we'll talk about process um, waste peels and stuff. And also when it comes to farming, you know, when you harvest your farm produce, all those materials you don't eat out of the harvest, those are waste materials. How do you recover value from them and put it back into the food system? So that is really important to know. And, and why is it more important today? Because as we move transition, which is all part of sustainability um, and also part of climate change, as we transition from um, current use of oil and gas to using more renewable energy like solar and wind, what we'll see is that there's going to be a continuous increase in the cost of uh, fertilizer. We witnessed a bit of spike recently um, when you know, there was scarcity of oil and gas, which simply means that if there is more of that, we will help less fertilizers to use in green food, which we are actually trying to even move away from. And then if we move away from that, what do we use to um, strengthen the soy nutrient and help the soy nutrient um, to meet the, 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 the crop production requirement? This is we are using waste materials. By, I, I think what that also brings us to the question of what is oil and gas? Oil and gas is nature decayed biomass. So what we're doing with our digest unit is taking nature and then automating nature. So we call the iDigest an automated by upcycler. So it's just automating the nature of breaking down food and then recovery by nutrient from it and then making it possible that local farmers can use it for food production. So that's what we do with the iDigest unit. So I think that's a bit of things I've touched here is about, first of all, um, how we treat food waste today what is you know fertilizer in the first place? What is the future of fertilizer as we transition to more um, sustainable energy? And how can we sustain food production using materials? And how do we do that um, without allowing that to decay in nature into oil and gas again, and then collect it and then process it and then produce the fertilizer? Can we use automated biosystems to be able to do that in the most efficient way? Um, so that we can recover these bionutrients and use it back into food production. That is fundamentally what we do with our digestion. So it's a machine that can be put anywhere that food waste is produced to break down food waste and enhance that bionutrient recovery. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, that was that was a fascinating one. I know that Mark Fenty, one of our trustees, has also been talking to you about that around the anaerobic digest. And I, and I know farmers are increasingly using that as a technique for their farm uh, waste and farm produce. Uh, but it, in terms of the products that are produced, I, do, am I wrong in ask, saying that uh, you, you're working with hotels and uh, large restaurant chains to do this, to get food waste, to make use of it into new, new products? Yes, exactly. Okay, so where there are those things going on. Uh, is there an ambition to get that to household waste? Absolutely, we are able to do that and we speak to a number of councils. So hopefully we'll be knocking at the caution council very soon to see if it's something they want to take on. We wouldn't, you know, put responsibility on individuals, but we can partner with councils to be able to pull it out within um, households uh, to be able to use the solution. Yep. Brilliant. So it's instead of going to food, uh, to, to uh, uh, landfill or whatever, we can find ways of doing it uh, to recycle uh, in a new way. Yeah, and uh, more, impo more importantly is that the fact that that is going back to the local community so and that's why having local food producers who can use this bionutrients are very important it's very very important um to establish that network of local food producers that use the local nutrients from local consumers so it's kind of that circularity complete circularity of the food system that is um essential to, to help to this to try that's brilliant thank you um <laughs> Anybody else want to come it, in with that? It just touches upon something you highlighted earlier on, Clive, about uh, new systems, uh, coupled with what uh, IF is doing. If farmers broaden the rotations and go back to a type of farming that existed pr pre the Second World War, the requirement for artificial nutrients will drop quite drastically. And we've got out of the habit of having a balanced farming system. 
And so, as I say, that's why we're like a, a like a bunch of drug addicts. We need the next fix from the fertilizer. The crops have been developed to actually require that fertilizer and require all those pesticides and insecticides and herbicides. The way that plant breeders have operated have been to cater to that. And if we go back to a more holistic farming practice, where you're growing one crop to help support another, one crop gets rid of the pests and diseases of another. In fact, what most people you know, practice in their gardens every day, knowing full well that if they do something in a more intensive way, it's gonna cause them a problem down the line, so they just avoid it. If we go back to that practice and link that in with what IF is developing in, not having waste, but having a co-product of what you're doing and ut utilizing that back into the circular system that I uh, highlighted. That's the way we start to resolve these problems. Um, but it, it's a very steep uphill um, uh, transit that we're going to need. Uh, th this needs to be done very quickly. And I have a fear in the UK that unfortunately, because of what's going on in UK farming, farmers may be encouraged to actually intensify and take land that was not in production or doing other things into production. So it would, would actually achieve the exact opposite of what we want. Um, you know, the, the jury's still out on that, but there's, there's been a, a big change in the UK farming system and we don't know which way it's going to go at the moment. We're only just finding out now about the new government policies and how they're going to treat the, you know, this, this, a uh, big area of human existence, <laughs> eating. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Clifford. I know that living in Lincolnshire and cheek by jowl with uh, uh, fens or farmers um, that are involved in, the, in those processes, there are, they are all waiting with uh, some bated breath about how they change what they're doing in light of the, the, the change that are being proposed. Can I, one last challenge to us all here is if, oh, sorry, Hilary, well, uh, no, I don't want to interrupt you, but yeah. um, and going back to something really rather basic, um, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, food production and nutrition and, and food waste and all the rest of it. And I'm actually rather ignorant about, and maybe other people here know more about this, I'm very ignorant about what the school curriculum uh, covers these days in terms of sort of cookery and food production and I do think this would be a very important area if it was taken much more seriously in schools I mean I, I know for a, you know when my daughter was uh, she she's well out of school now but when she was at school it was really thought to be rather unfashionable to teach basic cookery uh, and I, I'm hoping that you know this has gone round full circle and maybe it's a bit more uh you know highly esteemed now and 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 growing vegetables and and so on i do think it's really very important that 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 ed, the education system actually treats this very seriously because i think it is a very serious issue um is jane gonna say something yeah it's one of my uh, little uh, things that I feel quite strongly about actually because I think my children are probably of a similar age and learned a lot more about designing a pizza than they did about basic cookery skills. As it happens they're both quite they're both foodies and are very interested in cooking and do almost all of the cooking in their households but I think that's basically because I insisted that they learnt to. Um, what I would say as as I have a primary background, I would say that most of the primary schools I have worked with, and as Clive knows, it, we're into the hundreds, um, I've seen lots of evidence of children growing their own food and eating it. Uh, and there are some schools who are doing an awful lot in terms of including basic cookery into the curriculum. I think the challenge for primary schools is that they don't always have the facilities for every child to cook um, regularly because they don't have they don't all have kitchens. They often have food that is bought in for hot meals and that sort of thing. But I do know of schools that have their own kitchens and they use them to to support the work in the curriculum. 
I can't speak for secondary schools, but uh, I would hope that the curriculum is beginning to swing back the other way because I feel very strongly that it's an important part of um, what is needed in order to maximise better use of food because if people don't know how to cook, they they can't provide nutritious meals that um, you know and pl plan and budget for it. And so yes, I do feel very strongly about that. But I, I would say that in primary schools, there's a lot of effort. Quite whether the the secondary curricula um, focus has changed that much, I'm not entirely sure about. I don't know whether you could help with that one, Clive. Yes, I was just going to say we're, we're going to roll this up, but, uh, but my comment will be, first of all, uh, I'm going to say thank yous first. Thank you to uh, Ithiana for your uh, expertise, and that's what we, we bring to this uh, session. So your engagement with the modern, recent and current developments is very helpful for us all. Um, certainly in terms of education at the moment, as I see it, there are some schools which are committing themselves to sustainability. I'm a governor of one which is working on how it does everything, including bringing back uh, gardening into the school curriculum uh, and I also do food. But it is against the uh, trend in most schools, that was what I would comment on. And the, a friend of mine said recently uh, that uh, nine year olds know more about um, uh, relationships in some ways, <laughs> without being explicit than uh, they do about where the food came from on their plate. And they can use a phone and technology far better than they can use a, a fork in the garden. So the, the issues about growing up and being able to engage those things is almost the same as the conversation I had with uh, Bagua in, uh, in Sri Lanka. We've lost the plot in terms of young people growing up and their, their engagement with these things in a local level. Uh, uh, that's my belief anyway. Um, just to say to thank you everybody that's taken part tonight. Uh, this will be, uh, uh, as again, recorded. It's, it's something that the other UNAs can use if they wish, uh, uh, as others are. And if you do do that, then uh, you, you'll see that it's low key and it's a possibility to just set other conversations going. The last challenge I'm gonna to give to you all uh, as of tonight is that if you are gonna say something to a, a, a grandchild or someone who is in, uh, you know, under 11 years old around what it is that they could be doing and thinking about to achieve sustainable development goal two, um, what would you tell them? Because if we are in the business of making a change, it's about an intergenerational dialogue we need. So it's not just about uh, the old people or the young people or the middle people, it's about all of us working together in our producing, consuming, and our citizenship roles in this country. Thank you once again for all taking part. And uh, thank you, Bert, for managing all those things uh, that you manage. <laughs>